Today on The Hookup, it's part three of my ultimate secure smart home network series. In part one, I walked you through hardware selection using Unify equipment. In part two, I covered VLANs, wireless networks, and firewall rules. And today we're gonna look at port security, intrusion prevention systems, and VPNs on the Unify 6.0 controller. In part two of this series, I mentioned that I made a questionable decision by putting my most untrusted devices, which are my IP security cameras, onto my main untagged VLAN. Some of the questions that I saw in the comments indicate that you may need a crash course in networking. So here's a quick and dirty overview of network communication. This definitely won't be the most in-depth look at the OSI model that you've ever seen, but it will hopefully be easy to understand and give you enough information to help you make the right decisions for your network. This video is sponsored by PCBWay.com. If you're a tinkerer, inventor, or maker, and you haven't checked out PCBWay, you are seriously missing out. They obviously produce full-featured printed circuit boards with a ton of different materials and options, but now they offer basically everything you need to turn your ideas into a physical reality. Whether you need 3D printing, injection molding, CNC machining, assembly, or just plain old PCB manufacturing, PCBWay can do it all for highly competitive prices. Check out PCBWay's awesome services using the link in the description to support this channel. Layer 1 in the OSI model is called the Physical Networking Layer. Whether your devices get connected with radio waves, coaxial cables, ethernet, or fiber, it's still layer one. Layer two is called the data link layer, which is not a super helpful name, especially when it comes to VLANs. When two devices are on the same LAN segment, VLAN, or subnet, meaning that they share the same base part of their IP address, they can communicate directly using a network switch. You see, a switch has a big table of device MAC addresses and the corresponding port on the switch that they're attached to. One device sends out a network frame with a source MAC address and a destination MAC address. And when that frame reaches the switch, the switch will look it up in its table and send it out to the correct port. Importantly, layer two communication doesn't require any input from the router and therefore can be done very quickly and efficiently. But since the router isn't involved, that also means that it doesn't check any firewall rules and therefore we can't deny communication between devices on the same VLAN using firewall rules. Layer three, on the other hand, is the network layer, which is a fancy way of saying that it uses a router to determine the correct path between devices that aren't on the same subnet. If two devices are on different VLANs and therefore different subnets, they need to go through the router in order to communicate. And as I said before, if they use the router, they also get checked for firewall rules, which then allows us to regulate their traffic. All right, back to the problem at hand. I made a firewall rule to block my security cameras from the internet and from my other VLANs, but I can't block them from communicating with devices on the same VLAN because they don't need to use the router to do that. So, as I mentioned before, the easiest way to break into my network would be to come to my house, tear down a security camera off the wall, and then plug your device into that camera's ethernet cable. So to minimize that threat, I'm gonna use a feature that's available on Unify and most other managed switches called Mac filtering. To do this, find the client that you want to assign to that port. In this case, it's a Hikvision camera. In the right-hand panel, you can see the device's MAC address, which you'll need to copy. You can also see the port that it's attached to, which in this case is port one on my 16 port Gen 2 switch. Clicking on that link will bring up the switch, and then you can select the ports menu at the top and click on the pencil icon to edit the profile of that switch port. Anytime I make a MAC address isolation, I always name the switch port accordingly so I don't end up pulling my hair out later if I ever need to change the device attached to that port. Under MAC filter, paste in the MAC address that you copied from the clients page and then hit add. Then scroll down to the bottom and hit apply. You'll see your switch change to provisioning and after it's done, the only device that will be able to connect via that port is that specific camera. Now, technically, someone could grab the MAC address of the camera and then use that MAC address to spoof the MAC address of their own device, which would then allow them to have access to other devices on my network via layer two. But honestly, this solution is plenty secure for me, and unless you're storing government secrets on your network, it's probably good enough for you too. As always, I encourage you to test things for yourself, but as you can see in this example, connecting my laptop to the restricted port doesn't even give me an IP address. So not only can I not access the internet, but I also can't access any other devices on the network. I also mentioned in my last video that I wanted my daughter's PC to use the content filtered network. So what I'll do is find her computer on the client list and take note of which port on the switch that it's connected to. Then 
Click through to that switch and under ports, hit the pencil icon to edit the overrides and then select the family network as the available profile. This will force any traffic attached to that specific port onto the content filtered network. This is also how you would put an entire unmanaged switch onto a specific VLAN. Just make sure that the uplink port that you're using is assigned to the correct VLAN in the override section, and then all of the ports on the unmanaged switch will also be on that VLAN. If you have unused ethernet ports in public places, it is best practice to leave those ports completely physically disconnected from the switch. This is a process called air gapping, and it probably applies to very few homes. But in the off chance that a business is watching this guide, please don't leave public ethernet jacks attached and connected to your main VLAN. They are by far the easiest point of entry for any attacker with physical access to your building. And honestly, it's just as bad or worse than leaving the room with all of your client records unlocked. Even though firewall rules and port security are the most important tools for securing your network, there are a few other features available in the Dream Machine Pro that can provide additional layers of security, specifically IPS and IDS. IDS stands for Intrusion Detection System, while IPS stands for Intrusion Prevention System. And they both have the same main concept, but different final outcomes. IDS and IPS work in the same general way as antivirus software on your computer, which is oddly similar to your body's own immune system. Basically, when a new virus is discovered, security researchers try to pinpoint a part of that virus that's sufficiently unique to identify without also falsely identifying non-virus files. They call this part of the file the virus's signature. These signatures get added to an ever-growing and constantly updated database that your antivirus program can reference as it's examining each file on your computer. If part of the file matches the signature in the database, it will be flagged, quarantined, or just outright deleted depending on the preferences that you set. IDS and IPS work in the same way in that they reference a large database of signatures related to malicious network traffic. If you have intrusion detection enabled, any matches will generate an alert that you'll have to deal with yourself, while intrusion prevention will block that traffic automatically. The likelihood of false positives and the impact on your network if legitimate traffic is blocked will determine whether IDS or IPS is right for you. It's also worth noting that inspecting each packet for malicious traffic is pretty CPU intensive, and while the Dream Machine Pro claims to have 3.5 gigabits per second of throughput with IPS enabled, this metric is tested using very similar traffic types and packets, and it's reasonable to expect that real-world throughput may be less. I have actually been able to successfully cap out my Dream Machine Pro CPU at 100% utilization by downloading multiple very large torrent files at the same time. This increase in CPU utilization is likely due to the nature of torrent files, where the data is being pulled from hundreds or sometimes even thousands of unique sources very quickly. Under non-torrent-based heavy transfers, the CPU utilization never even gets close to 100%, so I imagine that's got something to do with it. To that end, you can actually select categories in the IPS menu that refer to a specific subset of signatures for malicious traffic. So if you want to use peer-to-peer -peer software on your network and you're concerned that your traffic will be blocked by IPS or that your network speeds will be significantly slowed, you can actually just disable that whole subset of malicious signatures. Unify hasn't been particularly transparent about where they're pulling their signature database from, whether they're maintaining it on their own, or how often it's being updated, but most people who know more than me seem to think that it's largely based on a product called Suricata, which is a popular open source IPS and IDS solution. I also can't find any information as to whether the signature files are being automatically pushed to the UDM, or whether they're being pushed with each new firmware upgrade but I definitely hope they're gonna offer that option to upgrade signature files without completely updating the firmware of your device. Because signature updates should be happening significantly more than device updates, and you should be able to do them without the fear of breaking changes. All right, so that covers the security of the devices that we willingly attach to our network. But one of the largest vulnerabilities of any network comes when we override the implicit deny rule for incoming traffic. As I said in part two of this series, basically all networks are set up so that internal traffic can leave and returning traffic called established and related is allowed, but external traffic shouldn't be allowed to initiate a connection with anything on your network. However, if you're running a service on your home network, like a media server, camera system, or a home automation hub, you may want to be able to access that service from outside your network. And the way that you do this is by forwarding requests made to your external IP address to an internal IP that runs that service. And if you imagine your firewall as a giant building with hundreds of office doors called ports, knocking on most of them will get no answer. 
But occasionally, when you knock on a door, it will open and you'll be led down a hallway to another door which belongs to a specific device on your network. In the Unify controller, you can see all of your forwarded ports in the advanced features, advanced gateway settings, and then port forwarding. They also show up in your firewall rules as ghosted text that cannot be edited. If you have ports forwarded that you don't remember doing, you may have UPnP enabled, which is a service that allows devices on your network to request that port be opened. There is almost no reason to have UPnP enabled on your network, so you should definitely disable that in the Advanced Features menu, and then take a hard look at which devices you actually want to have exposed to the internet. The more devices on your network that are exposed in this way, the greater your risk. In cybersecurity, we refer to this as your attack surface, and the best practice is to minimize attack surface as much as possible. Think about a castle. A castle wall doesn't have hundreds of exterior doors. It has one main door that's highly fortified. Basically, instead of needing to ensure that each machine and service on your network is secure, which is often impossible with devices like security cameras and NVRs, you put all of your services behind a single door and then you fortify that one door as much as possible. If you're running a lot of services for a lot of people, then you might need to set up something like a reverse proxy for this door. But for most people with only a few services and a few different people who want to be able to connect to them, the best and most secure solution is to use a virtual private network or VPN. VPN in this context is not like the ones that you see advertised on YouTube all the time. A VPN is a secure tunnel between one device and another. In the case of NordVPN or TunnelBear, you have a secure tunnel between your computer and a device at a remote location called a VPN concentrator. This type of VPN allows you to securely send your internet traffic to this remote location through an encrypted tunnel, and then your traffic leaves that remote location exactly as if your computer was located inside of that site. This is useful if you're trying to hide your traffic because you're doing something illegal, or if you want to access content that's not normally available in your region. The VPN that we're going to set up works in the same way, but for a totally different purpose. Anytime that we're outside of our home network, we'll use a VPN tunnel to connect back to the Dream Machine Pro, and then after that, all of our traffic will appear to be originating from inside of our local network, which allows us to access all of our local services just like we can when we're home, but without the risk of exposing those services to the internet. To set up a VPN in the Unify 6.0 controller, click on Settings and then Advanced Features. Scroll down to where it says RADIUS Server. RADIUS stands for Remote Authentication Dial-In User Service, even though dialing in really isn't a thing anymore. In this default profile, you'll want to define a user for each person who's going to log into your VPN, in this case, me and my wife. Each user has their own password to protect their specific account, and the VPN itself has a password to prevent unauthorized access. As you can imagine, best practice is for each of these passwords to be strong and unique. Don't use the same password for your VPN as you do for your users. Next, head back over to the network section and add a new network. Give it a descriptive name. And then under VPN settings, you'll select Remote User. The only protocol that's supported by the Unify VPN is L2TP, so you can't change that. And then under Pre-Shared Key, you're going to enter a secure password that your users will need to know in order to connect to your VPN. Enter the gateway and subnet that you want your VPN clients to connect to, and then remember to adjust your local IP address's firewall rule to include this new subnet. For name server, you can just leave it on auto, and then make sure your default radius profile is selected. To use this VPN on your remote device, you'll add a VPN configuration using L2TP. Then for server, you'll put in your external IP address for your Dream Machine Pro, or use a dynamic DNS service like DuckDNS. For account, you'll put in your name that you define in your RADIUS profile, and then the password for that user. The secret is the main password for the VPN that you define when you set up your new network. If your device supports split tunneling, you can configure it so only individual programs and services will use the VPN, but for the most part, you should just select Send All Traffic for the most trouble-free configuration. A VPN solution isn't perfect, and some services aren't going to operate properly without exposing them to the internet. Push notifications, for example, are a service that typically requires port forwarding, and it's difficult to change those settings to set up push to work within a local network. As always, after you put a solution in place, you should test it to make sure it functions as you expect it to. You can see, for instance, that when I try to connect to my Blue Iris camera server on the cellular network, I get the response, no connection to the server. But after connecting to my VPN, the server connects almost instantly, allowing me to remotely view my cameras without needing to expose them to the internet, because the VPN makes it appear as if the traffic is local. 
Am I telling you that you absolutely shouldn't do any port forwarding? No. But for each service you're considering exposing, you should ask yourself these four questions. Number one, how sure can I be that the developers of this service were both competent and security conscious enough to minimize vulnerabilities? Number two, how often is this service being upgraded to provide security patches for the ever evolving cybersecurity race? Number three, what data or privacy is at stake if the service is compromised? And number four, how likely is it that other devices in the house could be attacked as a result of this forwarded service being compromised? In the future, I may make a video about reverse proxies and more robust VPN solutions than the built-in Unify VPN, but for now, this series has been long enough. So, thank you so much to my awesome patrons over at Patreon for continuing to support this channel. If you're interested in supporting this channel, please check out the links down in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that thumbs up button and consider subscribing. And as always, Thanks for watching the hookup.